Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find a link to all of our blogs, all of our Twitters, and our entire back catalog of over 100 episodes on scientific computing, engineering, and other things. I have again here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks for your time. Hey, Brock. How's it going? Good, good, good. Uh, before we roll into this, I do want to make a small announcement. Um, I have a little bit of a different job opening available right now in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan, um, developing using containers and container orchestration software for big data. So if somebody has experience with Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes, or anything like that, uh, hit me up. You can find contact information on the website at rce-cast.com and uh, let us know if you're interested in that position. All right. With that administrative note, let's jump right into it today. Uh, today, we've actually got three guests on here, and we're going to be talking about the Sage 2 project. So, uh, gentlemen, I wonder if you could introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Jason Lee from the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications at the University of Hawaii. Hi, my name is Dylan Kobayashi. I'm a student under Jason Lee. I'm uh, working towards my PhD in computer sciences, and I've been working with the Sage 2 project for about two years now. And I'm Luc Renambeau, a research associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago at the Electronic Visualization Lab. Okay, so uh, so we're here to talk about Sage. So I've been following Sage for a while. Can you guys give me an overview of what Sage 2 is? So Sage 2, as the name implies, is the second generation of Sage. And what Sage was was essentially a piece of middleware that allows you to uh, drive large display walls as if they're one contiguous campus, uh, canvas, allowing you to post visualizations and information onto those walls. Uh, whereas Sage was all written in C++, the new Sage 2 architecture is entirely uh, re redone by in uh, Node.js and uh, JavaScript technologies. So what motivated you to switch from C and C++ to Node.js? Because, uh, you know, off the top of my head, it would seem that C and C++ would be a much higher performing uh, language and have better optimization possibilities than the other technologies you cited. So part of it was uh, actually an experiment. Uh, we had start, started noticing that computer graphics on browsers were get, starting to get powerful enough to be able to do something real as opposed to you know, just uh, you know, little video games. Uh, and uh, in a little experiment, we decided to write just a, a small piece of test code to see how well it performed for a Sage-like task. And then we said, well, let's go full tilt and see what, what would happen if we try to port the entire Sage architecture to it. And surprisingly, it worked well, very well. And on top of that, we get the benefit of leveraging a lot of the JavaScript infrastructure and a lot of the tools that this large community has already been developing. So what are some use cases then for Sage or, or Sage 2? Um, what kind of, um, wow, let me do that. Again, entirely. Let's pretend we're still on the break, and I'm going to just start again. Uh, so what are some of the use cases for Sage 2? I mean, why would you buy uh, a video wall, and you know, what are some things that you would want to display on it? Um, the community of users that we work with uh, typically have large amounts of data, uh, and they produce visualizations uh, of them. And, uh, you, you know, it's just one picture doesn't give you the answer to the research question they're looking at. Usually it's a bunch of different images uh, from different data sets, and they're trying to put it all together like a giant jigsaw puzzle uh, so that they can come up with whatever story is hiding behind all this data. Uh, it's very typical for users to uh, come to a meeting room with, with the large state walls and start throwing information onto the walls and talking about them. Uh, or they would form a, a, a little meetings where, as part of a research meeting, uh, people would come in and deposit information onto the walls and have discussions. Okay. okay, so most of the time when I see display walls being touted, they're always talking about how many megapixel it is, and they always have one giant image of you know the cosmic background radiation or something like that. But you're saying the most common use case is actually to generally have multiple images up there um, through time or different variables for the same simulation. What's the goal here? Is this a productivity boost for researchers or just a nicety? Yeah, yeah it's both a productivity boost, but also uh, a, create, a creativity boost, right? Uh, you know, when I teach classes, for example, using Sage, 
I often give my students a, a data set and then when they come back, uh, I, I ask them, well, what have you been able to visualize with this data set? And then they can throw up all the different approaches that they've come up with to visualize the data, like a giant pinup board. And then we can discuss them, like why did you choose to use color to represent this particular attribute versus, you know, uh, size, right? And, and you're absolutely right. Historically, uh, large display walls uh, were, were typically used to drive one giant picture, right, at very high resolution. And that made sense in the past because, you know, part of it was pushed by the HPC world uh, where we had an enormous amounts of data and we wanted to try to produce the best visualization possible using the highest resolution lens possible. But as people start becoming more productive and trying to use these dis displays, they, they thought, well, why don't we have our cake and eat it too? Throw both high resolution content, but also lots of it. Because frankly, there is just so much different types of data that they have to look at. Okay, so let's jump back a little bit here. Um, what exactly is the relationship uh, between the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Hawaii at Manoa where you guys are working? Because clearly we have two groups of you on today. You know, what, uh, what is the breakout here? How do you guys collaborate? Uh, so um, I was previously the director of the lab in Chicago, and I was professor at UIC before I moved to Hawaii, uh, just because the weather is so much more awesome here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so this project was something that we began back in Chicago as far back as uh, 2004. And so this is just a continuation of that project. Okay, so you said in the past people were just driving large megapixel displays. Uh, there was another project that appears to be dead now called Chromium. What is the, is there any relationship between Sage and Chromium? Different philosophy, two people trying to do the same thing, what's going on? Yeah, so it's, Chromium was really an implementation of OpenGL over the network, if you want to see it. The goal was kind of the same. You wanted to drive large display wall with uh, real-time graphics. And one approach was to basically send the OpenGL commands to the display nodes directly. But that's the model that Jason described, where people were putting a large amount of effort to, dr to drive the wall with one application, displaying a large simulation result, for instance. And if you wanted to see the second re simulation result, you have to stop the application and start another one or, or something like that. And when you compare to how you really work, it, that's not the way you work on your laptop, for instance. How many applications do you have open when you try to solve a problem? You have email, you have uh, an a office suite, you have um, a simulation package, you have statistics, and, and, and so on and so on. So people do not work with just looking at one image or one representation. You want to see multiple images, multiple views of the same data set or multiple data set from last week or the previous run of the simulation and so on. So that's one, that was one goal of Sage was trying to let you show multiple uh, data set at once and leveraging those high resolution walls, not just for demonstration, but for actual work. So uh, how does this work? What is the architecture here? Is there, do you have to have a, a dedicated server set up and you you know, send the output of each application to the server who then projects it to the wall? So yes, in, so the Sage one model was really pure streaming. So there was an application was rendered on one machine and we, we were streaming pixel to the display nodes. And then when we saw the, um, the power afforded by the browsers, we change that model and say, let's try to do the rendering inside the browser. So now we have some kind of web server in the middle that manages all the resources, but the rendering is done on the display side. So, does it, so you talked about you know having multiple applications and the way you work on a normal machine. I'm sitting at my desk here and I've got my laptop with two 27 inch displays hooked up to it, but I'm out of ports to be able to connect stuff. If I wanted to have more, could I use Sage just with my normal machine and have more email and more terminals and more things? Does that work? Or it, you just talked about having a web server. Is, does everything have to be a web app? Yes. I mean, yes. One, one uh, trade-off was, was to say, let's try to use only web development tools to, to drive those display wall because we, we gain a lot by using the browser as a, as a runtime system. So we leverage the audio API, the 3D rendering API, and all the web APIs available. And the, the trade-off is we have to convert your application to, to web application. 
And when that's not possible, we use a lot of desktop sharing where you just push your laptop to the wall and using the same technology you see in Hangout or, or Skype desktop sharing and, and so on. Okay, so there, you have to be using some middleware that makes your desktop show up in a web browser right. to, to make it work. So I can have MATLAB plot some giant thing on this, but I'm doing it via screen sharing and then the wall is just scaling it up. Yeah, yep. that's the first. That's the first step to to show just the immediate content. But then, if MATLAB generate a high resolution images, you take that image and sh and and drag and drop it onto the wall and so it, and see it in full resolution. Yeah, what we found is that um, sort of many science based uh, applications have been you know moving towards a portal interface for their end users. I mean, and in fact, you know, even uh, things like uh, 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 Google Docs, right, or Microsoft uh, uh, Online, where you're actually uh, typing in your word processor or your spreadsheet directly into the browser itself. Within the Sage 2 framework, we can actually bring those documents directly onto the wall now as part of uh, the applications that you can show. Uh, even uh, many commercial vendors that are producing, uh, you know, historically very powerful and, and well used visualization tools like Arc or VTK. They've also jumped on the uh, the browser bandwagon, and because of that, we're able to take advantage of it and very quickly put those capabilities into Sage as well. So, is is Sage two then pure software, or are there specific hardware requirements for the server side or the video wall side? I would say there's no strict set of requirements. <clears throat> so currently, we have a PC, a gaming PC, actually that you can buy just from almost any of the major. Sites, for example, we use an LMware, and um, it's just a regular consumer PC. There's no special parts, and it can run on that perfectly fine. Uh, if anything, the limiting aspect in this particular setup is the network, is we need to transmit large amounts of data, so the network has to support it. But if you don't have to worry about the network usage uh, being particularly high, then it'll work on a regular home network as well. Now, okay, hold on. So I work for Cisco, so I got to nail down what you're saying about the network here. When you're talking about a large amount of data, are you talking about like 802.11g has a problem? Or does 802.11ac be good? Or are you better wired in for 1 or 10 gig connectivity? Like what, what kind of bandwidth are you talking about here? Uh, so that actually depends on the wall and how it's used as well. So I can give an example of the summer I worked on a 40 gig Mellanox network and the particular data that they were using were high resolution. They were peaking over 15,000 uh, pixels by 15,000 on a small image. The really big images were close to, I think, a gig in nature, but those had a very difficult time being up, uh, how to say, updated at a uh, constant rate especially when they had two streams going, and they sort of gave up on that idea. But for the sake of having a constant stream of updates, yes, uh, it really depends on what you're trying to show. Okay, but uh, so from what I just heard from you there, 40 gig, we're definitely talking a wired network for any kind of reasonable type of visualization. So there's uh, a bit of difference of between what different steps. So if you are within the room between your laptop and the wall, wireless network is perfectly fine. If it's when your application wants to access large amount of resources, and that communication is mostly between the server, the stage to server and external storage, for instance, and that you, you can leverage whatever in infrastructure you have and leverage in high speed networks if, if you need to. So does the amount of data being transmitted to the wall then depend on the number of uh, panels in the wall? No, it depends on your application. So if you're just showing pictures and PDF documents, it's going to be, be using very little uh, network. Uh, if you want to show 4K movies at uh, uncompressed resolution, for instance, or very high, anim very high resolution animation, that's going to be uh, using a lot of bandwidth. So it's really dependent on your application. It's like asking what bandwidth Windows is using. It, interestingly, there is no bandwidth uh, used. It depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, to directly answer that question, 
yes, certain applications will actually be multiplied by the number of displays connected in terms of bandwidth usage. Is there a concept of developing your application to be Sage native? Like, oh, one of the large scale visualization tools like Visit or ParaView, um, where you could have, you know, the parallel Visit server talking to the Sage cluster and not just be sharing your desktop from your laptop to Sage. Like, does that concept exist? So we provide an API, but uh, it's up to you to port your application to do that uh, to do that partitioning of the data or of the pixels. Natively, Sage doesn't impose anything of that sort. But we have explored uh, both scenarios. Basically, what Dylan did this summer, we're trying to port Parview application by, uh, being rendered on a on a cluster. Or, or just pushing pixel finer images out of a simulation or something like that. Let me elaborate on that, Dylan. Okay, so actually the pair of your example is uh, one that was occupying the 40 gig network. Um, so what it did was Sage had a, a native app interface that would connect with the pair of you web server that would then connect with the pair of you server for data access and actual computation. So between the pair of you and the pair of you web servers, they would do actual computation manipulation and then send it back to Sage through the app uh, on the native resolution of what whatever the user specified to view the results. And that one was, for example, one that used large amounts of bandwidth, partly because separate and distinct displays that need to be updated. And for the, yeah, that was the one with the high pixel resolutions. Okay, so if you're doing everything in web, and you're primarily really just letting multiple people screen share to one giant virtual screen. I inject me if I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, do I have full support for things like DirectX or OpenGL? Or does that not even make sense because I'm really just sending images and that's happening on my laptop where I'm actually like rendering my app? So you can render whatever the browser can render. So the browser exposes WebGL as a 3D graphics API. So that's one. And otherwise, what the browser can display are images like web formats, basically. So JPEG, P, um, PNG, and GIF. And, and then for video, it's mostly MPEG-4 these days. So, so anything you can render to the browser is, is, um, can be supported in some way in stage two. So 3D graphics is WebGL, and otherwise images, PDF, movies, and so on. Now, as I understand it, Sage 2 also supports multi-location interaction. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, can we you just describe that a little bit? So, um, so Sage 2... So collaboration has been a big part of, of the effort in, in Sage 2 from, from the beginning. So we want to, as soon as you have a wall set up in one room, you want to collaborate with people across campus and across the country or across continent and, and so on. So uh, within Sage 2, we have support to share application and share assets between display wall of various size and resolution. So you can share documents, you can share movies and videos and, and PDF documents. And on top of that, we support sharing application where the application are synchronized between the different sites. So you can imagine a PDF document, what you want to synchronize is a page number, for instance. So when I flip to page three on my local document, every site is going to see the, the, the page three of that same document. Okay, and so what we're really talking about here is, you know, two people with their own video walls uh, and one person is driving the application that shows up on both walls. That's what we mean by collaboration, right? Yeah, and there is no master or no, um, not one person is, is driving the application. Once it's shared, everybody has control of the application. Oh, so it really is like full-blown screen sharing, not just... I need to use Google Hangouts because Google Hangout runs inside the browser and Google Hangouts has the ability for me to also give control. Sage actually has a little bit more going on. 
Yes, the application are synchronized through the server. And, and there is server-to-server -server communication to ensure that we maintain uh, the state of the application across these several walls. Uh, so we, you can synchronize, for example, a, a viewpoint inside a 3D application. You can synchronize the page number or the time inside a, a movie player, for instance. So does this have full-blown video conferencing? I, I guess that means just start up Skype, start up Google Hangouts, start up whatever application you want, and everybody will see everybody. Not really. That's not how we view it. It's always been fairly hard to support video conferencing or to trying to invest in developing video conferencing systems. So basically, we leverage whatever people want to use and whatever whatever infrastructure they have locally. So when we work with JSON, we use uh, Skype or Hangout. If people have life-size or video conferencing unit, uh, they use uh, that too. But at the end, it's more often pushed to the wall through desktop sharing. So we do, do not enforce any video conferencing solution inside Sage 2. <laughs> Now, that's interesting. You, you cited several different types of systems there. Uh, how do you handle uh, the portability between those systems? So, for example, um, if I'm rendering a movie to my wall locally and my browser knows how to render uh, movie type X, but does that mean that the remote browser also has to know how to render movie type X? Or is there some kind of magic mojo translation that happens? Well, the mojo is a standard that people, it's a WS3C standard for, for browsers, basically. So people have agreed that movies are mostly MPEG-4 these days, and, and WebGL is standardized and so on. So that's where we gain a lot using the browser as a, as a middleware, basically, to do all the computing, is that uh, most of, there's a lot of standards in, in, in that domain. And so we can be sure that we can play, in, for instance, a movie MPEG-4 in all the browsers. Um, for communication, for desktop sharing, for instance, we use WebRTC as a standard to do the communication and so on. So if you want to do audio, there's a standard for the audio API. And um, yeah, that's, that's one of the main goal of using the web browser as a rendering engine is that there's a lot of standards. And so you have a good chance that something runs here uh, on my machine and across browsers and across systems. Do you guys have a video online that kind of demonstrates a lot of the functionality of Sage and Sage 2? Yes, we have a series of videos on YouTube, either at, on the VR site or Jason's uh, Lava uh, YouTube channels. And we have a, a series of videos. And most of them are published on our website, in the sagecommons.org website. Okay, we'll include links to those in the show notes also so people can find those at rce-cast.com on the show notes to go along with this episode. All right, so with the browser compatibility issues, do you then have like minimum requirements for browsers? Because in the bad old days, browsers were not all entirely compatible and I, I'm, I'm not really in the, the web area of things, but I understand that things have gotten much, much more portable recently so are there minimum versions that you require or do you you know only work with chrome or you know how does that go we mostly use chrome but we try to make sure everything works across all the system and indeed uh, the browser have been getting much better these days so it's mostly html5 basically and it's a minimum requirement is to be able to run html5 with most of the standard uh, we don't track especially the version numbers of Chrome or Firefox or Microsoft Edge, for instance, but the core functionality of Sage 2 works across all the main browsers these days. Okay, so let, let's get into the scale of how big this thing can actually go. What would you call the largest Sage deployment out there? I'm guessing probably by you know the total number of tiles being driven or pick the metric of your choice. Okay, so I think... Uh, we can, I don't know exact examples offhand, but the thing behind us is uh, 32 displays, and um, that is for all of them are 4Ks, so 3840 by 2160. So it's a 256 megapixel wall driven by eight computers 
uh, each display of the 32 displays is 4K in resolution. So yeah, JSON has a, probably the highest number of pixels. So yeah, o over 200 million. At UIC, we have a system with maybe more machines and less pixels, so around 100 million pixels and, and 36 machines. Um, but more and more systems are driven by a single machine. We're trying to push the, the definition of a sage war, mostly around consumer technology, meaning a powerful gaming PCs and, and as many 4K screen you can plug into a single machine. That's what we see is the most deployable configuration to end users like scientists, like a biologist or, or geoscientist and, and so on. Mainta maintaining cluster is, is very hard and it's not, in a domain science uh, task to do that or to allocate a, a, a grad student to maintain just a cluster. So we are going yeah, mostly 4K TVs and gaming PCs. So if you're if you're putting everything onto one PC and hooking as many displays to as you can, why even use Sage? Why not just open up your application there rather than share it up to there? It seems like you're introducing complexity. So What's, what's the benefit of having this machine in your lab with a bunch of displays hooked up to it, but only having one? The benefit of that is the web server. Um, because the Sage, or the Sage deployment uh, also includes the web server itself, uh, you turn your system into uh, an accessible through the network. And assuming that if you need to go through uh, public IP, or rather if you have, sorry, if you have a public IP, uh, or public host name that routes to the computer, then other people uh, outside of your network is able to access it as well. Another way of also saying that is, uh, you know, whereas a desktop computer, uh, or even if you've had a large wall running just native Windows, you can indeed run many apps on it. However, the typical model is that you have one mouse and one keyboard that controls the whole thing. In Sage, it's completely multi-user. You can, in fact, any number of people can simultaneously launch apps, drag and drop documents onto the wall simultaneously. And they all have their own mice. You can actually see many little mice pointers running around and they can all move content around at the same time. Uh, and, you know, th and what we found was that we had to do that because as the windows grew bigger and bigger to cover the walls, it was just impractical to use Windows because Windows was just not designed to support apps with extremely high resolution. You would open up dialog boxes in Windows and it would appear on like on the far right hand side of the screen. You click on it and another dialog box would appear on the far left hand side of the screen and the mouse is like flying back and forth trying to deal with it. We re completely redesigned our Sage user interface. So when you click on a dialog box, mm -hmm. uh, the dialog box actually pops near where your mouse is. All the apps have their own menus that are, are, that are close to them, so you can quickly access it, as opposed to having you mouse back and forth across this 256 million pixel wall. So here's a question that we ask a, a lot of our guests. Um, what is the strangest use of your project that you've heard of? Like something, somebody's using Sage in a way that you hadn't really anticipated or planned on, but it works for them. Okay, so um, Sage has a web browser uh, aspect now that's uh, fairly recent. It's only been in since, uh, I think, the last part of uh, 2016. And one of the things I've been doing with it is because I need to test cross-site uh, usability, I'll actually open a Sage display client within the Sage display on a different site so I can see what the other site is doing while I'm doing the remote session uh, synchronization. Um, so. Naturally, it's supposed to be able to mirror mode, but it's very rare to have a mirror mode active within a natural Sage display of a different site. <clears throat> so another thing I've seen done is that professors, uh, one particular one, had a Sage server running in his office. And it wasn't high resolution, it was only 1024 by 768. But the reason he did that was because for his lectures, uh, rather than using the standard AV equipment in the room, uh, while he would use the projector, he would open the browser, connect to his own server, so that all the students would then be able to connect to his server back in his building, rather than just have a static uh, lecture where uh, he would be stuck with screen sharing, literally from the cord video output of his laptop. 
Otherwise, as a funnier project, I run Sage 2 on a Raspberry Pi at home just as a picture, picture frame. So I have my pictures being pulled off something like Flickr or, or, and so on, and I just rotate pictures on at maybe changing picture every 30 seconds and so on. And, uh, and we in the lab, we used basically Sage 2 as an information, information displays. So we show the weather outside, we show the webcams and so on. I think Jason was showing the surf uh, on the beach. Um, so as an information display, it's a, it's a great uh, utility. What you do is you have the stage wall set up, and then uh, you can connect to it with your phone as long as you have internet connection. So uh, depending on what you're doing, have the stage wall set up, and then someone goes out in the field, takes pictures, and then uh, sends them back to the wall. Uh, especially with the, uh, uh, depending on you're trying to find something. Uh, like, was it, went to the, the beach, you're trying to find the, the seals or something? So what's coming into future for Sage? What's coming down the pipeline? <laughs> so um, now that we've got this infrastructure up, one of the things that we put up um, towards the end of last year was a, an app store. Um, you know, people, because they're starting to develop apps for it, we'd like them to be, uh, have the opportunity to share it with the Sage community. Uh, Sage is only as strong as the apps that can, that can enter it. And um, because everything now is in JavaScript, it's become easier for people to contribute. Uh, we want to see initially uh, most of the apps that people are going to be posting are essentially open source because you know this was an NSF funded project. Everything we distribute is open source. Uh, if the community decides that hey maybe we can start doing monetization where individual app de developers might want to charge some money for their apps, you know we're actually open to that possibility too. If, so, if it sort of uh, encourages people to develop more uh, more uh, apps for it. So you mentioned the commercialization aspect of it. Uh, are you looking to do any commercialization of the core of Sage itself, like uh, deployments and support and things like that? Yeah, we've uh, we've actually licensed Sage already to a, a couple of uh, companies. Uh, one of them is in Brazil, I believe, and the other one, I forget which one it is. You, the, the UIC technology manager knows the, the, the details of that. Uh, they are actually applying it to their own very specific niche markets. Uh, one of them is like a monitoring of uh, energy uh, uh, power plant, is basically operations. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, available for uh, for licensing certainly. Uh, we uh, don't have the time to you know because we're spending so much time developing Sage already. We don't have the time to say spin off a company to to drive this. Um, but you know, it's encouraging that companies are coming to us now saying, could we potentially license it to turn this into a, a, a product? So what, like you mentioned that this is, is open source. Do you have um, some kind of like free for non-commercial usage kind of license or what, what license do you distribute it under? Yeah, it's a license from the University of Illinois at Chicago. So it's a basically free to use as long as you don't make money out of it. And then if you want to sell uh, Sage to installation, for instance, you have to get a license. But otherwise, it's open source. Yeah. And the source code is on a Bitbu uh, Bitbucket site, so something like GitHub. But, uh, so it's open. You can go and download the source code and, and send us commands and pull requests and, and uh, bug reports and so on. OK, well, Luke, Jason, Dylan, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can people find more information about Sage and download it and get involved? So the main site is sagecommons.org, and, uh, and everything is available from there. OK. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> OK. All right.